Welcome to Going Deeper. My name is Marcy Sklove, and today I'm sitting with the Reverend Dr. Andrea Vazian. Andrea is a lifelong social justice uh, worker and activist, and she has most recently started the Sojourner Truth School for Social Change Leadership. Right. <laughs> I've been practicing that all morning, and uh, I just want to Thank you for coming and being with us. Thank you, Marcy. I am delighted to be here, and I'm honored to be on the show. Thank you. Sure, sure. So I often start my interviews this way. Um, I, I'd like to hear how your early life impacted the choices that you made for your path. Like, what were the seeds that were planted back then that have informed your, your whole journey? Well, great. I'm glad to begin there because it allows me to say that I am of Armenian descent and that is central to my life and my identity and I think it has informed all the choices I've mm. made in my life. Um, my father, Levon Fred Ivazian, was born <clears throat> in Turkey in 1919 during the uh, genocide of the Armenian people, which mm -hmm. began on April 24, 1915. And uh, my father and his brother and his parents escaped literally in the night mm -hmm. uh, to Lebanon and then to Paris and then through Ellis Island to America. And my Armenian identity uh, has informed my whole life for because I grew up with grandparents on both sides. Mm -hmm. I'm Armenian on both sides all the way back. Mm -hmm. And my father and my grandparents told my sisters and me mm -hmm. stories of the atrocities. They called them the atrocities, then they called them the massacres, then they called them the genocide. Wow. Um, and when we were too young to know these stories, we heard them. Mm -hmm. And when we were too little, we absorbed the um, loss and fear and sorrow. Mm -hmm. And my father, who bless his memory and his soul, mm -hmm. uh, died a few years back, but spent his whole life, he was a physician and a writer, wow. and he spent his whole life trying to get the Armenian genocide recognized by the world, by America, by Turkey and had great hopes at different times that it would be formally recognized, which it was not. So to have your trauma mm -hmm. and the loss and the pain and the wounds not recognized by this country or by Turkey and actively denied by Turkey was a great source of um, pain for my father who wrote about the genocide, who spoke about the genocide, who told us in great detail about mm. the genocide. So I believe that my Armenian heritage has informed my life and my love for justice. Many Armenians in this country, in the diaspora, are committed to social justice and yeah. to fairness and to inclusion because of the trauma sure. in our spirits and souls and in our history. And like our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community, right. we carry the scars and the wounds. Wow. In fact, it was, um, it is documented that when Hitler was planning the Holocaust, mm -hmm. he actually um, was talking about his plans and a close comrade said to him, you cannot plan for the extermination of a whole people. Yeah. And Hitler said, who any longer remembers the Armenians? Oh my goodness. Wow. So we were the first genocide of the last century. So mm -hmm. my love for justice and my work for peace and yeah. inclusion, yeah. I think is rooted in the family history and in the history of our people. Wow. I can imagine that given that background, it could have taken you a different way, full of bitterness, full of resentment, you know, isolation, all kinds of things. So 
it's beautiful that it did take you in positive directions. And you know, you know something. I love that you've said that because the Armenian people, yeah. my people, my sisters, my family, yeah. my grandparents who lived through it, it's such a funny thing, but we balance mm. this great sorrow and mm -hmm. this unrecognized, unacknowledged genocide and these, this loss and pain, and it was brutal, brutal, brutal. And the Armenian people are also joyous and wow. funny and celebratory yeah. and... It's a very interesting paradox that yeah. we that we hold these two things mm. in our gigantic Armenian hearts and that we both grieve and can touch and weep about that place yeah. so easily and so quickly. Yeah. And we also are lovers of music and art and are funny mm. and food. eat and celebrate, <laughs> exactly, food yeah. and celebratory and we yeah. are this wonderful combination of both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very beautiful. That's very beautiful. So from what I know, your social justice work started when you were pretty much in college, right? Right. And that was during the Vietnam yes. era. Yes, yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. And then when did you have the calling to develop in your spiritual, you know, credentialing as well. Credentialing. I went to Oberlin College mm -hmm. in 1969 and the Vietnam War was raging. And I tell people that I must have gone to class, but I don't remember. And I must have had a major, <laughs> but it seems dim. We um, were protesting the Vietnam War the whole four years I was there. Mm -hmm. And what I most remember is that on Friday, a whole bunch of upperclassmen, mainly men, would um, arrive at Tappan Square with great big rented U-Haul trucks, and the backs were the back of the trucks were filled with hay. Hmm. I don't know if other people did this. And we would all climb in and lie down in our sleeping bags at night on Friday night and fall asleep <laughs> in the back of the U-Haul filled with hay, and people would take shifts and drive through the night, and we'd arrive oh in Washington, D.C. to march the next day. Wow. from Oberlin, Ohio to Washington, D.C. Huh. And if it was hot, we'd get in the fountains and oh. um, sort of have little mini baths. Um, and that is what I remember most, uh, uh, marching and rallying and vigiling in D.C. and those long trips in the hay mm -hmm. on the way down. The other crucible that really made me who I am today was that it was at Oberlin, mm that I um, really discovered that I was a woman. Now I knew which box to check yeah. when I applied to college. Sure. I knew my gender, but I didn't know its political significance. Mm. And at Oberlin, gathered around Becca Armstrong's broken little uh, coffee table mm. in her off-campus apartment, a group of women gathered and it was my first women's group wow. and it was my first women's consciousness raising and support group. And we talked about our lives. And we read Gloria Steinem, and we read Sherry Moranga, and we read uh, Friedan, and we read, mm -hmm. we read wow. all those, or we read our bodies ourselves mm -hmm. when it was just a mimeograph stapled together. I do too, mm -hmm. Marcy, yeah. I do too. Mm -hmm. That stapled together, mimeographed our, early our bodies ourselves. Sure. And it was consciousness raising to learn that my gender had political significance, mm -hmm. and to learn the word sexism and to go to the first ever Oberlin College um, Psychology of Women class and later wow. to be a TA in that. So the Vietnam War and the women's movement in mm -hmm. the years between 1969 and 1973 made a permanent impact on my life that I wow. never varied from, yeah. never left. And after Oberlin, um, the two significant things were that um, at Oberlin, I learned there was significance to my gender and to mm -hmm. my being a woman. And then after Oberlin, I learned there was significance to my being white. Mm. And um, mm. I had a really uh, strong experience of a um, African-American woman at a gathering I was at in Boston who confronted me and said, Andrew, you spent a lot of time talking about the significance of your gender and how sexism is so significant and how men need to work on their sexism and how you do all these women's empowerment things. 
But as far as I can tell, it's the only area where you're targeted. Do you oh. ever talk about the significance of you being white? Wow. And it was truly like somebody had just, yeah. um, the scales from my eyes, as mm. the Bible would say, were, it fell away. And I thought, if I, who think I am such a fine little activist, yeah. don't get the significance wow. of my whiteness, then other people like me don't understand. And sure. I, that was in the early 80s. And I devoted myself to learning all about race and white privilege and ended up getting a PhD in racial and ethnic studies and teaming up with oh, uh, Dr. Beverly sure. Daniel Tatum and doing a cross-race dialogue with her and working with her as a biracial pair. And we crisscrossed the country for wow. a dozen years. For a dozen a years. A dozen years talking about um, anti-racism organizing and education and and Bev and I were a team for which I am mm. profoundly grateful and it changed my life forever sure. to have to team up with Bev Tatum who I'm still very close to and just retired as the president of Spelman College of in Spelman. Atlanta. Yes. So yes. when you first got involved with her was she at Smith? Then? She was um, she was never at Smith. She was at Mount Holyoke oh, College. Mount Holyoke. So first when I met her she was at Westfield State very proudly. Then she went to Mount Holyoke College Okay. in the psychology and education department and then she became the uh, dean of the college okay. and she became dean of the college when i became dean of religious life oh, so we were together wow. for a number of years I in see. parallel positions okay yeah. that's really amazing but i didn't answer about my call to the ministry yeah you didn't so briefly on that my grandfather on my mother's side, mm -hmm. Antrenig Arakel Bedikian. It's mm. a beautiful Armenian name, A-A-B. Yeah. Antrenig Arakel Bedikian yeah. uh, was a, a congregational minister. Huh. And although a man of small physical stature, mm. he was enormous in my mind. And we grew up knowing that he was the pastor for over 40 years of the Armenian Evangelical Church which was a storefront church on 33rd Street in New York. And he just loomed very large in my mind. And he preached in Armenian and in English. He was a remarkable person, an author, a man of letters, a fine preacher. Amazing. And when I experienced a call to the ministry, I was filled with doubts because I didn't think I could be like my papa. Wow. That he was just the quintessential mm. pastor and yeah. I couldn't measure up. Sure. So I actually struggled with my call to the ministry over a 10 year period. Really? 10 years. And w can you describe what the call felt like? <laughs> I, when I first experienced it, I thought I'm called to the ministry. I'm called, I was a Quaker at that time. Yeah. And I thought, member of the Religious Society of Friends, and I thought I'm called to vocal ministry. I really, am called to be a pastor but it seemed impossible and I was filled with doubts and so I went into a period of prayer I applied to Harvard Divinity School mm. and I got in and I walked around and I couldn't envision myself there mm -hmm. and I came home full of doubt it was like anguish so I spent 10 years kind of thinking about it and then I got my doctorate and then I mm. and I and I just doubted and then but I always used to read all these spiritual books and I kept thinking maybe I'm called to the ministry but I'll never be like my papa. And then <laughs> my partner, Michael Clare, yeah. and our little one, Sasha Clare Vazian, yeah. were on Prince Edward Island one summer. Sasha was young and now he's 30. Gosh. And we were in a cabin by near the water, not right on the water. And Michael was putting Sasha to bed in. The, his little room in this cabin on PEI and I was reading Life of the Beloved by Henry Nowen hmm. and a breeze was flowing into the, it makes me cry Aww. a breeze was flowing into the room yeah. through the open window and I was reading this book Life of mm. the Beloved by Henry Nowen I read all these spiritual books and Michael clearly had fallen asleep putting Sasha to, <laughs> to bed sure. and the, house was quiet and the breeze mm. was flowing and I lay back in the bed on the pillow and yeah. I put the book on my chest and I had an 
overwhelming sense of the presence of God oh and that gosh. I was meant to go to divinity school, that I was clearly called, that the doubts were over. Wow. And that it was, that I was called and I was worthy. Oh my gosh. And it was completely clear to me at that moment. Huh. And when I closed my eyes, I realized that, and this is really funny, that I was not going to go to Harvard, where I'd already gotten in right. years before, that I was going to go to Yale and that it was fine, that yeah. it was fine. And that was August. And from a rickety kitchen table in that cabin, I hand wrote on like paper we found right. a letter to Yale from Canada saying, I had this vision. My grandfather's a pastor. Mm. I think I'm meant to go to Yale Divinity School. I know it's August. I hope you'll meet with me. And I Aww. sent it from Canada. And I got a message back saying, apply fast. We think you can start in January. Oh, my goodness. And I did. I started in January. And why was Yale a better fit than Harvard? You know, I'm not sure it was. Oh. oh. <laughs> I'm not sure it was. Okay. But in the vision, it was, Sasha was little, yeah. and it was a closer commute. Maybe right, that was it. Maybe. And and I met wonderful people, and they mentored me. Yale did feel very male, mm. um, and I struggled, and I spoke out a lot, and I was a social activist who didn't fit in all that well, and I brought up things that not all the professors wanted to hear. Like, yeah. I would raise my hand and say things like, I'm looking at this syllabus and I don't seem to see any names of women. Are we reading any women? Ah. Are we are we are we reading any women and yeah. are there any people of color on this list and they'd say things yeah. like, you know, what what is your problem? Right, so right. I let's just say I went through Yale Maybe you, and got the Yale degree. Yale needed you <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> Who knows if uh, yeah. But the good news is I graduated. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, so I want to fast forward a little bit. Good, fine. Now, what what churches are you working with? Because I know you're do, you're doing something that I haven't yet heard about. The Haydenville congregation mm. I heard about was a dream. It and was a dream, and that was twelve years. Okay, and that's and finished. that that was finished, and that became a wildly social justice justice yeah. gospel that I preached in LGBTQ community. Right. We did wonderful things, and that was 12 years of a mm. wild and wonderful ministry. We were as progressive as you could be, and wonderful church, yeah. and wonderful 12 years. I retired in um, from that church in January of 2017, okay, just and I something. realized that I um, no longer wanted to uh, worship with predominantly white people. Gotcha. So I started going to churches in Holyoke and Springfield to yeah. just, as a retired pastor, to just go, to just yeah. be a congregant. Sure. And I went in all kinds of wonderful places in Holyoke and Springfield and landed one Sunday at the Alden Baptist Church at the top of the State Street Hill in Springfield. Oh, okay. okay. And um, the new, dynamic, fiery, fabulous pastor had just been called there, Dr. L.A. Love, the Reverend Dr. Louis Anthony Love. And... Uh, I sat three rows from the back, mm. and they looked around, and he said from the pulpit, do we have any guests here? And I was the only white person in the room. Oh. And they brought back a mic and said, will you introduce yourself? And I stood up and said, I am so happy to be here, and I'm so mm. delighted to meet you all, and I'm here to worship, and I'm a retired pastor, and I'm glad to know you and, and to meet and hear some wonderful preaching from your wonderful new pastor. And the Reverend Love leaned into the mic at the pulpit up there, and he said to me, Pastor, hmm. you're the answer to my prayers. Oh, my gosh. That's what I said. <laughs> and then he called the passing of the peace so everybody would talk to everybody, and he came tearing down the center aisle, and he said, I have been praying for people to help me bring back this church. You wow. were sent to me. Oh, my gosh. And I started to cry. Oh. And I said, I don't know. And he said, who are you? <laughs> so Aww. I have been worshiping there for a year and a half, a little over a year and a half. Wow. And sat three rows from the back from a long time until he pulled me forward. And now Aww. I'm on the ministerial team. Aww. 
Thank you, God. Gift to my life uh -huh. at the Alden Baptist Church. Fantastic. Yeah, even though I'm United Church of Christ, they will have me uh -huh. somehow, and I'm in a Baptist church in a leadership wow. role, and I love them, oh. and I am called to serve that them. That is fantastic. Wow. So that's, it's a great, fi fiery, beautiful, energetic, remarkable service that runs from about 10.30 to 1.00 and the time yeah. flies by. Oh, that's great. That's just great. Um, so I wanna, we have just a few minutes uh, for this part one, but when I first met you, and now I'm confused because if Sasha is 30, my restaurant was started in 1988. The year he was born. Oh my gosh. The year he was born. That's, the, that's when I met you. Yes. Because you were all doing the war tax resistor, Randy exactly. and Betsy's house. Yes. You came to my restaurant. Yes. Got supplies. Yes, and, and went up there. Yeah. Yes, Marcy. That's exactly right. 1988. Okay. Thir yes. And then he was born what month? He was born in April, and Randy Keeler is his godfather. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is beautiful. Yeah. So that was a huge. Huge. Uh, activism piece. Yes. And can you just spend a little time talking about other big activism moments yes. here in the Valley that you were part of? Or you could just speak about that one. But what, what's what been happening over time quickly? Uh -huh. and, uh, we have about five minutes. Uh, the Vortex Resistance has been a very important centerpiece of my life. Yeah. And, um, and Randy and Betsy's house being taken, and then a group of us went and reclaimed it. We were called the Morning After Team, and we went in and reclaimed and lived in the house yeah. um, for several days, reclaiming it and having <clears throat> workshops and singing and, and living there. So tax resistance has been such an important part of, of my life. Another very important part of my life in the Valley has been my work on um, LGBTQ, um, the civil rights and civil liberties of the gay, lesbian, transgendered, <clears throat> bisexual community. And um, Michael Clare, my partner and I, who you know, yeah. met and became a couple in 1985 and were very committed to the uh, civil rights and civil liberties of uh, the gay and lesbian, trans and bisexual community and um, decided at that time to defer our marriage. Mm -hmm. This is 1985 until all members of the gay and lesbian community could be married with the same rights and privileges. Mm. So we spent a number of years, almost 30 years, um, yeah. uh, yes, um, speaking about why we were not married, not accepting any, um, obviously we couldn't be on each other's health insurance, insurance or anything like that. Wow. So it's an expensive witness, sort of, sure. because we had to carry different family plans. And Sasha was born and we were unmarried. And um, so we did a lot of organizing and a lot of work as a as heterosexual allies mm. to the LGBT community. And I, as a pastor, married many same gender loving couples, many. Sure. And then a few years ago, Sasha got right up in our face and said, you know, you always said that you'd be married. I was gonna when ask. When all gay and lesbian people could be married and what, so what happened? Uh, here you are, yeah. you've married all these gay and lesbian people and you're not married, I think it's time. And we looked at each other and said, you know, it might be time. Aww. Yeah, very sweet. So about three years ago, Sasha got the one day license and Aww, he married us. Gosh. <laughs> and Aww. he was 27. And he literally said, Marcy, he literally said, Dad, will you take Mom Aww. to be your lawfully wedded wife? Whoops, I touched the mic. <laughs> and Mom, will you take Dad? And apparently it was a beautiful service. I was weeping too hard to oh sort of notice gosh. or remember anything. Sure. It wasn't videotaped, but there are pictures yeah. of me crying and us. So gay and lesbian organizing, peace and justice work, um, anti-racism work with yeah. Deb, um, vortex resistance, very, very important, and also earth stewardship. That I've done a great oh. deal around um, climate, change climate change activism and yeah. um, help found in 2001, help found Religious Witness for the Earth and did oh. a lot of civil disobedience in different cities and different places around climate justice and helped lead the first really large march. We marched across um, um, <coughs> Massachusetts in 2007 
starting in Northampton and ending at the State House, um, and so have done a lot of work around our stewardship. Wow. Okay, this is a great start. Um, we're going to keep going in part two. And uh, thank you all for being with us, and we'll see you in part two. Yeah, when I was a little boy on my mama's knee she said son let me tell you about that